this kind of abuse is like so insidious and sick because it's hard to see from the outside. From the outside, all you see is this beautiful family who all have these like perfectly manufactured smiles, right? And like be suspicious of that shit. Okay, hi everybody. Thanks for coming back if you've been here before or hi, welcome if you're new. My name's Mickey, I'm a therapist and we talk about therapy things on this channel. Today, we are talking about Jill Duggar's memoir called Counting the Cost because I think there is a lot for us to unpack um, about child abuse and deconstruction. For what it's worth, this is not going to be a chapter by chapter retelling of the book. That's not really my bag. Um, there are lots of wonderful wonderful creators who do do that. I don't know if Rachel Oates is going to talk about it. I have a sneaking suspicion she probably will. So if that's up by the time that this goes up, I will link that in the description for you guys. But generally speaking, I want to highlight some key moments that stuck out to me as a therapist and a clinician. A, because I think they're great education um, about like child abuse and toxic family stuff. But B, because I think this is also like a really wonderful moment that we have this like triumphant story of like surviving abuse and, and being victimized while simultaneously proving the point that I've been saying uh, for a really long time about how therapy um, is something that is intended for everyone, regardless of your personal convictions, I guess. Uh, we're gonna get more into that later, but I just, um, I'm excited to talk about it. So first and foremost, we're gonna talk about something that I actually mentioned in the original video that I made about the Duggar family. Um, I did rewatch that before we started making this and it actually aged really well, so good for me. Um, but I wanna play you guys a section from that video because I think the commentary about that is especially poignant now um, that we have Jill's like corroborating testimony about this whole thing. Before we talk more about that, I want to pause and give a shout out to this week's sponsor, which is Beducated. I'm so excited to be working with Beducated again. For those of you who don't know, Beducated is an online educational platform that's dedicated to learning about all things sex, intimacy, and relationships. We love Beducated around here, not only because they have over 100 plus courses uh, about all things sex, intimacy, and relationships related, um, but also because their courses are fact-based, evidence-based material, and y'all know how much I love that. I recently took a Beducated course that's all about getting back in your body and out of your mind during sex and intimacy, which I have really enjoyed because it's a thing that uh, me and lots of other uh, women and femme presenting people have struggled with. It can feel hard to unlearn this attitude of like performing during sex, which can uh, limit your experience with pleasure and like really immersing yourself in the moment. And I love that Beducated has educational content towards helping people unlearn this and really get the most out of sex and intimacy. One of the other things that I love about Beducated is that it's explicit, but it's not pornographic. As a person who really values specific <laughs> instructions, uh, when I'm trying to be educated about something, I think Beducated really nails this balance of giving people actually actionable advice that's specific and easy to understand without it feeling objectifying. Beducated generally as a platform is so wonderfully inclusive and it just feels like such a safe place to learn about things that oftentimes we don't really know who or where to ask that question. So I'm really, really excited to partner with Beducated again. Like I said, I just genuinely am a Beducated believer and so I'm really excited that Beducated is hooking me up with a discount code for all of my followers. Right now, if you use my code Mickey Atkins, you can get 40% off of the yearly pass, but Beducated also has a one day free trial and a 14 day money back guarantee. So genuinely you have nothing to lose. And like I said, I really, really am excited to share this resource with you because it's something that I think everybody needs. So go click the link in the description, get yourself 40% off of the annual pass and level up your sex life like I did mine. Thanks so much to Beducated for sponsoring this week's video. Let's go ahead and hop back in. Before I show you that, I do wanna be super clear um, as a like disclaimer from the top. We are talking about this again because I think this is a wonderful um, opportunity to point out a lot of learning about child abuse and deconstruction and all of the things. But I also feel compelled to just be clear that Jill Duggar, um, I guess Jill Dillard and her husband do still very much occupy a lot of conservative uh, Christian, conservative beliefs that are harmful to marginalized people. Um, so please don't be confused. This is not me uh, <laughs> celebrating um, the bigoted things that Jill and her husband still believe. That said, I think we can hold in one hand that like generally speaking, some of the beliefs that her and her husband uphold are shitty uh, and harmful while also celebrating a story about deconstruction, about survival and the those two things like coexist at the same time. I just wanted to make that clear, um, just to be uh, really transparent that like one doesn't have to cancel out the other in order for us to talk about it and like hopefully glean some good learning for that. So let's get into uh, the topic of enmeshment, which like I mentioned before, um, I talked about in my original video, so I will play you that clip right now. One of the things that I wanted to hit on here is that the core concept with enmeshment is that when we have enmeshment between 
individuals, but also within a group like we do with the Duggar family where they're all kind of enmeshed with each other. Any individual who makes a reach for autonomy is perceived as being hurtful to the group and to others. It's perceived as an act of emotional abandonment. Oftentimes the core beliefs that we form when something like this happens is that it's not safe for me to meet my own emotional needs or that it's not fair for me to honor my emotional needs. That's so fucking abusive. The reason that I wanted to bring this up is because the statement that I made in the original video about how any move for independence is perceived as uh, emotional abandonment and betrayal is especially uh, timely, knowing now um, what Jill's experience actually was with her dad specifically, but uh, Michelle also to a lesser degree. I am gonna play you guys sections from the audiobook periodically um, just to help illustrate the point. Okay, just kidding, actually, this is editing Mickey. As it turns out, the audiobook clips that I tried to include got cut copyrighted. So uh, we're going to have a little story time moment. I'm either going to read you stuff or just like verbally summarize while I show you guys screen grabs of the actual book pages. So sorry about that. Again, this is not meant to be like a chapter by chapter retelling, but where it's useful, I'll try to stick it in. But one of the things that we see, don't be that way. One of the things that we see in the memoir repeatedly um, is that Jim Bob and Michelle, mostly Jim Bob and Michelle to a lesser extent, I guess, were explicitly conveying um, both contempt and judgment, um, but also like an active disapproval and shaming of Jill trying to reach any amount of uh, independence or autonomy for herself. Which also for what it's worth, I do wanna pause really quick and just talk about Michelle uh, and her behavior in the book because I think there's a lot of really interesting stuff to unpack there. I'm gonna try to make this video as concise as I can because there's really a lot for us to unpack, but I don't really have time to get into all of the nuance here, but I did just wanna note what we know now, which is that Jim Bob by and large is the parent who is perpetrating a lot of the most uh, overtly abusive behavior. I do think it's important to hold Michelle accountable for the way that she was neglectful and like basically co-signed Jim Bob's abusive behavior. Um, but I also want to point out something that I originally mentioned in that first video, which is that in situations like this, it's so incredibly key for us to be aware and to air out the nuance that exists um, in regards to simultaneous uh, perpetration of abuse and victimization. The women in this culture, for those of you who are not familiar, um, are very much victims of this uh, overtly misogynistic and patriarchal culture that really devalues and dehumanizes them. Um, and I think this is just uh, useful to note, not only because it's like relevant here, but also because this does happen in other cultures. Like this is not a thing that's exclusive to the Gothard uh, sect of fundamentalism or fundamentalism generally. This is a, a dynamic that we see played out in abusive households um, in a secular sense also. There were a couple of times in the book where Michelle seems to be trying to connect with her kids or almost like soften the blow of Jim Bob's shitty behavior. Um, and again, I am not at all interested in writing off Michelle, just like turning a blind eye to Jim, Jim Bob being abusive. Um, but I did just wanna note this because I do think that there is an aspect of misogyny um, in regards to the way that people speak about the women in this culture, even from the outside outside. And so again, I just want to encourage people to be aware of that, um, especially as folks who are, um, you know, trying to create a positive benefit in the world and things like that, or positive impact rather, being aware and being open about the simultaneous uh, identities that exist here is important. I'm going to play you guys a section from the audiobook actually, because there is one thing that stuck out to me specifically where Michelle delivered a contract to Jill that Jill had been trying to get Jim Bob to send her. Um, and the, the circumstances around it are really odd. So I'm going to play you that really quick. Okay, so in this section, Jill talks about how one night at 12, 15 a.m., she woke up because she heard her storm door opening. Her and Derek were obviously very distressed about this, uh, but as they looked out the window, they realized the car out front was her mom's car. So she watched her mom get in the car and drive away, um, and about 15 minutes after her mom had left, she got a text message from her mom that said, Jill and Derek, we love you all. I took the discovery contract in its entirety to your house late last night. I apologize for going by so late. I left it in between your screen door and your front door. Heart emoji, mom. Like I said, I don't wanna to get too lost in the sauce in this section, but I did just wanna highlight this because again, this is a thing that does exist outside of the like Gothard style abuse. Um, and I think it's just a really interesting example of like what this can look like, right? I wanna be super clear. We don't know for sure that Michelle was necessarily doing this in defiance of Jim Bob or that she was doing this to be like supportive of Jill necessarily. We don't really get any clarity in the book about like why the fuck this happened this way. But I did just wanna highlight this because again, um, it does seem like Michelle in this instance could be trying to 
advocate for her kids and like love on her kids in a way that sort of circumvents this very controlling affect that Jim Bob has. And so that's worth noting because we're going to talk about all of the roles that people play in families and stuff later. So just put a pin in that and we'll talk about that again later. So let's talk more about enmeshment. For those of you who are not familiar, the way that I describe boundaries to my clients typically um, is by helping people visualize like fences essentially. Um, healthy boundaries look ideally somewhat like a chain link fence, right? There's still a boundary there. There's still a barrier in a sense, but it's permeable. There's room for things to go in and out um, provided they're like the correct size. A more firm or like too rigid of a boundary is more easily visualized by like a brick wall or a concrete wall where like there's a very clear barrier and not really a lot of room for anything to go over or, or through. Whereas like enmeshed boundaries or a lack of boundaries is like not really having a fence at all or like, I don't know, like a fucking net maybe. <laughs> this uh, style of boundary is really characterized by there not really being any separation between people. This is very much what we see on parade in the Duggar family. We've talked about this before, but just to like, you know, to help clarify in case you're not familiar, that's very much what's going on here. And that's why when a child uh, essentially departs from the family's value system, people are so up in arms about it. So the thing about enmeshment that I wanna draw your attention to specifically with the Duggar family is the way that these parents seem to view their kids. There is very much the energy that all of these 19 children exist to be extensions of particularly Jim Bob, but Jim Bob and Michelle generally. And this is a thing that I wanted to highlight because this happens outside of religious uh, fundamentalism. This is a type of child abuse that exists like regardless of what your spiritual beliefs are. Um, and it's important for us to talk about. Some of the stuff that we saw, read, heard, whatever in the book are decisions that Jill made that were outside of the family value system that she caught a lot of shit for. Um, namely her not wanting to have her births filmed, um, her decision to wear pants and get a nose ring, and then also uh, Jill and Derek wanting to be paid for their involvement in the show. All of these things were met with pretty obvious contempt and created a lot of conflict within the family. Um, it's relevant for us to talk about some of the Gothard principles here. I will put the shiny happy people video, I think it's up here, that explains more in detail like what Gothard beliefs really are. So if you're not familiar, highly recommend. But it is important for us to pause here and highlight that in uh, Gothardism, there's this uh, value that Jill speaks to explicitly throughout the book, which is uh, about like honoring thy mother and thy father. This is essentially to mean that parents remain the authority figures over their kids like forever, basically. There is a moment in the book where Jill talks about how Gothard's specific advice to fathers is to start their own business and then employ their sons um, so that you can like provide for your kids. I think it's supposed to be like the benign way he wants people to view it, but essentially he's instructing um, adult men about how to remain uh, in charge of their adult children even after they've you know become adults and married and whatever. Okay, so this is the passage I'm referring to. Jill says, however, even though I couldn't see it at the time, IBLP also encouraged parents to clip their children's wings. They taught that children should stay with their parents until marriage and that instead of going away to college, children should stay home and pick up safer trades for work. They encouraged fathers to be self-employed, to build up a family business, and to have their boys work for them. It was a clear way of keeping full-grown adult offspring locked into the role of dependent children. Back then, seen through the eyes of my younger self, it seemed like a great plan. I didn't have any intention of leaving home or trying to make a life for myself on my own. Why would I? The world was dangerous and full of peril. At home, in the big house where my parents could protect me, things were safe. But no matter how much Pops tried to keep our wings clipped or how badly he tried to keep us huddled close under his own personal umbrella of protection, there was one child he couldn't prevent from making mistakes. It was Josh. This is all very much the thing of like, my kids exist in relation to me and my kids' identities are inherently tied to mine, which is a fucking problem. We've talked about this at length on the channel, but I do think it bears repeating because it's just really important learning. We as a culture seem to struggle with this a lot. Um, children do not exist to be a boost to a parent's ego or to make parents feel good about themselves. And children are very much autonomous and independent human beings. Granted when they're children, obviously they're not adults and so they require supervision and support and care and like all the things, right? But I do just really wanna be clear that if you want to be a parent, if you are a parent, it is so impre incredibly critical that you sit with the reality that your kids may very well grow up one day to have an entirely different belief system than what you have or that they may not embody this fantasy that you've drawn up in your head about what your child will look or be or behave like. If you can't sit with that reality, if that causes you a great deal of discomfort, 
heart, I really want to encourage you to pause and sit with that feeling and really reflect on why the desire to be a parent is there in the first place. Because ideally, when we're approaching parenting from a healthy place, we're doing it because we have a care and compassion for these people. The goal is to help these children discover who they are meant to be, who they actually are, not to try to force them into this box of what you think they ought to be because it's pleasing to you. This is very much the thing that we see Jim Bob and Michelle doing. This is, there's another Gothard principle that gets brought up a lot about how if you train up your kids the right way, um, that they will not depart from your belief system essentially, which is first of all fucking false, but second of all, outright fucking abusive. Like it, it goes without saying, I think how fucked up it is to predicate your care and respect and the, the effort, the involvement that you're putting into your kids on that essentially providing you a return and investment, right? Like children are not an investment. They're not things, they're human beings. And again, it's just, it's very important work for all of us to be doing that if we want to be a parent or a caregiver in some meaningful way, that we should love that child for whoever they are, for exactly who they are, not for the ways that they prop up our ego or make us feel good about ourselves or because they embody the things that we think children should embody. Erin and I were just chit-chatting because my foot's asleep, but I do just want to talk about this really quick. If your strategy for child rearing is having to essentially trick them in into doing the things that you want them to do, um, that's a fucking red flag, right? If you're like openly admitting that you're either uh, directly influencing the information that they have access to, um, or you're trying to force them to believe the things that you ought to believe, it seems to lend itself to this belief that like, maybe you know what you're doing is not a good idea, or like potentially is disadvantaging your kids. And like, again, this is another red flag. I just really wanna discourage people from doing the thing where we try to force our kids to be who we think they ought to be. For the sake of providing a couple of examples, I do just want to draw a picture of like what this can look like in a, a non-Gothard context. The sort of popular trope is the like washed up uh, high school star, football star dad who really pushes his son to be good at football because it makes him feel good. He has to like vicariously live through his kid, right? But this can also look like uh, people who do the like overachieving gold star thing with their kids. Um, they really want their kids to like do bigger and better than I did. Mothers who are jealous of their daughters or who feel like they lost their youth um, by becoming a parent. And so they try to suppress their daughter to like uh, soothe their own feelings of insecurity. Parents who were harmed or traumatized that try to prevent their children from branching out out of a fear that your kids will also be um, harmed. And also parents who lacked the agency in their own lives to soothe their own wounds or to like meet their own needs um, will sometimes do this where they exert control over their kids because they they lacked this agency and independence. And so they, they soothe that by trying to to control others, right? It's like the, the crux of the difference between empowerment and wielding power. These are, this is a non-exhaustive list, obviously, uh, but these are all examples of what this type of uh, dysfunction can look like, which obviously leads us to a place of, uh, at the very least, like shitty parenting, if not outright child abuse. For what it's worth, we also see Jim Bob embodying a lot of this in the sense that he is like obsessed with himself. Jill in the memoir describes a lot of behaviors that to me seem to lend themselves to this idea um, of a person who is so, obsessed with uh, his children glorifying his identity um, and that potentially being because of a uh, insecurity or a self-esteem issue or just generally um, like getting off on lording power and control over people. Um, there are a couple of things I just wanted to draw people's attention to. First of all, that he takes pictures and videos uh, of his fans. He does take pictures with them if they ask for them, but he also will like literally take videos of them and then send it to the group chat with his kids, which is super fucking weird. On top of that, Jim Bob is sort of famous for um, how obsessed, how fixated he is on the number of children and especially grandchildren that he has. It seems to be a source of particular fascination for him, but also especially the comments that Jim Bob made about Jill's uterus. Um, there is a moment in the book where Jill describes a very traumatic birth, essentially voices to a friend in confidence that she's not sure what her future uh, looks like in terms of fertility. and. A, Jim Bob, of course, is eavesdropping on this conversation and says something to the effect of like, well, we don't know that for sure, which again, just lends itself to this like obsession and fixation that he has with like having as many grandkids as possible. It's it's a very strange thing. It's a very like ownershipy sort of attitude. Again, I think it goes without saying how harmful this is, how um, contrary this is to promoting healthy development in children. I did, I, we've talked this to death, but I do just wanna be clear. When we talk about healthy human development, ideally children reach a point in their late adolescence, young adulthood, where they both have the resources as, 
resources and feel comfortable enough to branch out from family of origin. The fancy therapy word for this is individuation. But generally speaking, what we see is that at a certain point in development, we separate from family of origin to create essentially our own family of origin. Um, this doesn't have to include having children or getting married or any of the like relationship escalator things. Sometimes this can look like cohabitating with like friends or, or roommates or uh, other loved ones, but it can also include creating chosen family and just generally making decisions about the direction of your life that reflect you and your own desires rather than the desires of your family of origin. It is entirely possible, uh, especially if we have a healthy family of origin, that our life choices may um, overlap with the values and beliefs that we were taught in childhood and adolescence, but it's also possible at this point in development for individuals to develop their own moral compass, their own sense of right and wrong, their own desires and their own beliefs about the world and where their life is going and what love means and relationships and all of this stuff, right? The reason that this is important is because when we have the space, the time to really thoroughly answer these questions for ourselves, then we develop a really strong grasp on our own identity, our own sense of self, and like where we fit into the world. And this creates a shame resiliency. This creates an empowerment. This creates like a security and a stability that lends itself to positive outcomes in like all areas of life, but especially in relationships and, and like interpersonal things. When we deprive kids of the opportunity to individuate, we are essentially robbing them of their ability to create a healthy and secure sense of self, which can then fundamentally hold them back um, in regards to the relationships that they're forming later in life, which we're gonna talk about that a little later, but first and foremost, I wanna talk about uh, what happens when parents like Jim Bob, who are obsessed with this control, with this dehumanizing of their kids that they do, um, what happens when kids push back or, or branch away from that? I think it's probably not a surprise to anybody uh, that parents like Jim Bob don't respond well when people <laughs> don't put up with their bullshit, um, and this is very much what we saw in the book. Um, first of all, thing that stuck out to me was that Jim Bob, when his repeated and um, aggressive communication didn't work at getting Jill to answer him and to like essentially drop the issue. Again, I'm not gonna summarize the whole book, but essentially the crux of the estrangement that happened between Jim Bob and Michelle and Jill and her husband, Derek, um, was that Jill and Derek insisted that they be paid for their involvement in the show, which Jim Bob was very opposed to, among other things. But when that happened, Jim Bob took to communicating, calling, texting, reaching out to Jill in a way that it was like really similar to harassment in my opinion. But when that didn't work and Jill didn't answer his phone calls or return his attempts at communication, um, he weaponized his other kids. He essentially convinced his other children to reach out to Jill, uh, you know, by phone and text and email and whatever, but then also by just showing up at her house and demanding that Jill and Derek, her husband, talk about this, even at times that were really inconvenient for them. Okay, I know that reading it verbatim is probably uh, more helpful to you, but I'm trying to avoid getting copyrighted, so I'm just going to read you a small section of this. Um, she talks about how her dad went ballistic, and his first tactic was to hit the phones like we talked about. There was text messages, voicemails. He called every day, um, but in none of them did he give the answers that we requested. Uh, he was more so calling to make the conflict go away than to actually work stuff out. So then he uh, apparently sent Jill's siblings after her. There were calls and text messages from her siblings as well. And again, when that didn't work, her siblings uh, started visiting. She said that they'd want to spend hours talking it through, trying to figure out what our problem was and why we weren't doing what Pops wanted. Jill says that she felt obligated to at least hear them out, uh, to be respectful. And she said, I could just about cope with daytime visits, but when they wanted to stay up until midnight talking with Derek and me when Derek had law school exams the next day we finally told them no to which your sibling said what how come you won't talk this is way more important than law school and this is again what I'm talking about Jim Bob literally weaponized his kids and their enmeshment with him and the rest of the family unit to try to guilt Jill and to try to shame her into submission also of note is the itemized list that Jim Bob sent Jill for the cost of raising her which is a very clear and obvious ploy to make Jill feel ashamed of herself and to again try to guilt her into submission and to back off the issue of wanting to be paid. He essentially sent her this itemized list saying, this is how much it cost me over, you know, X amount of years to raise you. And so how dare you ask me for money when essentially I've like already paid you by raising you, which also to be clear, I just want to address this. Parents do this a lot where they, especially like really abusive, shitty parents do this a lot where they say, you know, after all these years, like I 
gave you a roof over your head and food on the table and all this stuff. And like, I just want to be super clear. That's the fucking bare minimum. Like that's the, that's the barrier to entry. That's like literally the floor. Like the bar is in hell. It's so low. Parents, first of all, are fucking legally obligated to provide their children with a place to live and with basic food and shelter. But also if all you have to show for the efficacy of your parenting is having met the literal bare minimum standards that people even provide to like animals, that's not really a vote of confidence about your bond and your, the value that you're bringing to this relationship between parent and child. So just like fucking full reject of that. But the other thing that's important uh, when we talk about like what happens when kids push back on this is that sometimes it can include uh, various types of abuse. In Jill's case, it was verbal abuse and in my opinion, psychological manipulation, but we'll get there. Um, but it can include all different types of abuse. There is essentially an implied or sometimes outright spoken threat that if you don't comply, then I will continue to become more and more aggressive in my attempts to silence you. In Jim Bob's case, this became verbal abuse and threats. Um, at one point he threatened to cut Jill out of the will, but it also, uh, there was a verbal, very obvious verbal abuse that took place um, in a mediation that they attended, which I'll play you the clip for that now, because I think Jill summarizes that really effectively. Okay, I think it goes without saying that Jill reading this in her own voice is much more emotionally impactful, but uh, as it were. So <laughs> during the course of this mediation, uh, Jim Bob said to Jill, you sent me a text message, Jill. You said I was verbally abusing you. I was so offended by that too. You know in your heart that's not right. Are you going to apologize for that? Uh, Jill says that she got nervous. I remembered the message, remembered sending it in the hope that it might wake Pops up to how bad I felt things had gotten to maybe make him give us a little space and let things calm down. I wasn't sure I could apologize for that. I glanced at Derek as I remained when Jim Bob sensed that there was no apology coming, he said, you're not going to apologize? Really? Jill says his voice was loud and there was an edge to it that I'd rarely heard. The moderator looked pale and was stuck on mute. Derek tensed and I could feel him getting ready to step in. I squeezed his hand, hoping he'd get the message. Please hold back. Please be quiet. Do not let this get any worse than it already is. It's at this point that Jim Bob took a step towards Jill, which Jill describes as not a gesture of reconciliation, but rather an act of aggression. She says, he towered over me, his whole body fueled with anger. My face flushed red, my eyes filled with tears. Then there was a long, awful silence that I wanted to fill, but just couldn't yet. Jim Bob responds to Jill's silence by saying, you know why you're crying, don't you? Your conscience is talking to you, that's why. It's at this point that Jill curls up in the fetal position, trying to quote, instinctively protect herself. Michelle starts crying and Jim Bob starts yelling, you're guilty, quote, stabbing a finger at me, standing right over me. When Jill is finally able to respond, she says, you want to know why I'm crying? It's that you think I'm some kind of horrible person just because I wear pants and have a nose ring, and yet you see that girl outside and praise her. That's why I'm crying, daddy. I'm evolving and changing just like that girl out there, but you can't see it. You treat me like I'm a prodigal who's turned her back on you. You treat me worse than you treat my pedophile brother. Pops looks stunned. Well, he stammered, I wondered whether he was about to agree with me and confirm that in his mind, my sins of disobedience really were as bad as what Josh had been doing. But finally, the moderator spoke up, I think we should take a break. Which also, just as an aside, this goes without saying, this is not at all what good moderating looks like. I don't think we addressed that in the video, but I just want to be clear, there's no world where a moderator should just, should just sit there and allow someone to verbally abuse another person within this mediation session. Like, that's wild to me. So first of all, it goes without saying that this is fucked up, right? I don't think I need to tell anybody that, but I did want to draw attention to this because when we talk about this type of abuse that takes place in homes, oftentimes it's being perpetrated by parents who are emotionally immature. Um, and I don't mean that in a like, shitty uh, like it's like as a dig there's a whole ass book called adult children of emotionally immature parents that i will link in the description wonderful read by the way highly recommend but when i say emotionally immature what i mean is that oftentimes people who perpetrate this kind of abuse find themselves emotionally dysregulated relatively quickly because they haven't done or had the resources to do the work on themselves to figure out first of all how to soothe themselves and how to deal with emotional distress but also who haven't progressed into a level of emotional intelligence that provides them with the opportunity to like um or, or that you know gives them the skills essentially um to like appropriately engage with things like empathy for example when i say emotionally immature what i mean is that it's almost this like childlike um emotional explosiveness that like we wouldn't really fault a toddler or a dysregulated teenager for but when someone becomes in a whole ass adult and still hasn't done this work about emotional regulation emotional expression conflict resolution this is the kind of behavior that we see happening which then becomes abuse right the reason that this is noteworthy is because developing strategies for how to deal with emotional 
emotionally immature people and especially um, emotionally explosive people can provide people with a whole lot of safety and a lot of reassurance in doing this type of work. I'm not going to like explicitly list all of those uh, strategies right now because like quite frankly, I don't have time, but also um, there are lots of other wonderful people who speak to this more succinctly. So again, um, I'll link that book in the description if you want to use it, but I did just want to address that. The other thing that I wanted to talk about in regards to this like enmeshment and, and Jim Bob's uh, emotional dysregulation is how this abuse plays itself out in real time. I think oftentimes when we as a culture talk about child abuse, there is sort of a caricature of like, usually it's physical abuse, severe verbal abuse maybe, but there's not really a lot of discourse about the way that Jill was abused most commonly, which is this uh, implied unspoken demands that Jim Bob makes of his kids. Um, which I think is really important to address because as a clinician um, who helps people work through this, but also as someone who's done my own work around this type of issue, um, I really want to address how insidious and fucked up it is when parents are able to essentially coerce their children and weaponize this dynamic um, to force them into compliance without having to actually explicitly ask them or tell them to do that. There is another section of the book that I think is really important to discuss, which is when Jill was on the Megyn Kelly interview with her sister. Um, she speaks a lot about, in hindsight, how she feels about that whole situation and the way that she wishes things would have played out. I will try to play you a small excerpt here. Okay, so here Jill is describing how she knows that her parents needed someone to defend them and vouch for them, but also to save the show. Ick. Uh, she says that she's one of the older kids, so she felt naturally um, more weight and responsibility to help in some way. She said she wanted to help to show them her love and loyalty in this hardest of times, but I had no boundaries, no sense of what I needed to do to protect myself. I was terrified and didn't want to do the interview at all, but I felt like it was the only way to prove my love and commitment to my parents. Jill says that in this moment, she thought she knew how much this would cost and describes how all the trauma that she'd been feeling, that she'd hidden, was all going to get worse. She talks about the shame, humiliation, and the feelings of being victimized and violated. But that was all going to get magnified all over again. But then she says, I would be willing. I'll do the interview and describes a wave of nausea hits her like nothing I'd ever experienced before. The room was spinning, the sound of blood rushing in my ear. I knew why I'd done it, but what had I done? I want to draw your attention to this though, because earlier in the book, Jill talks a lot about being uh, a parent pleaser and then eventually that developing into like general people pleasing later in life. Um, and this kind of dynamic is what I mean. Um, when I said that like Jim Bob weaponizes this dynamic, that's what I mean. There is very much a dynamic that exists where children who have parents that don't explicitly state their demands, but rather use nonverbal cues and like unspoken emotional connection. And especially when enmeshment is this high, when we're like this unaware of like our own separation from our family members, these kinds of kids typically become highly attuned to the emotions of, of people around them and they can with like an uncanny accuracy predict or or um, discern when people are upset when they're angry when they're sad when they're looking for something from you um, when people need something and they these kinds of kids develop into adults who are like hyper vigilant first of all um, but also a keen keenly aware um, of the emotions and feelings and needs of the people around them um, this is problematic for its own set of reasons we're going to talk about that in a second um, but the thing about this type of abuse that's especially in city in my opinion is that oftentimes this flies under the radar and like I want to be super clear abuse is not a contest and that one type is not worse or better than the other but I really do want to encourage people to first of all be aware of this and second of all to validate the shit out of this either for yourself or for others around you uh, because just because someone didn't explicitly tell you if you don't do this then I will revoke my love or you know do x y or z doesn't mean that it wasn't happening Oftentimes survivors of this kind of abuse have a feeling of shame and embarrassment about like, well, nobody asked me to, right? Like nobody explicitly said that I had to, but oftentimes the writing on the wall is still very clear. Um, and there is still very much this bid for uh, you to like do something for, like in this case, uh, for children to do something for parents. Typically it's to like soothe your parents in some way. What we see happening in the book though, is that Jill talks about how she didn't particularly want to go on this Megyn Kelly interview, but she really felt like this was a moment where she was supposed to defend the family, protect her parents, vouch for their parenting, um, help to preserve the reputation of her family and the show and all of this stuff. And so she volunteered to do this. And I can see a lot of people, or I could see a lot of people using this to say she has no right 
to you know point the finger at her parents because she volunteered to do this and this is why i wanted to talk about this this happens a lot like this is first of all a thing that people like survivors of this type of abuse say to themselves but also a thing that people say to survivors of this type of abuse which is that like well no one explicitly told you and like you volunteered and so that's your problem right and like no that's not true. That's not real at all. Um, there is very much a dynamic that exists in these families where if you don't intuit what your parents want from you, if you don't suss out what the emotional state is of your parents and the people around you, that life becomes dangerous. Being this attuned to the emotions of people around you becomes a survival mechanism for children who are immersed in these very emotionally dysregulated and very conflict-ridden um, and very overwhelming households. And I want to be super clear that's not to say that the conflict has to be like outspoken right it has not have to it doesn't have to be verbal or like obvious from the outside but there is still very much this undercurrent of like emotional dysregulation that exists and oftentimes this is like sort of the trope of like the emotional uh, support eldest daughter um this is very much a thing that happens where these older children become parents to their parents but also become the people who soothe everybody who fixes everything um and who does so without having to be told this also plays into this dynamic of like wanting to be a approved of and wanting to be seen and validated by your parents. And especially, Jill talks about this in the book, that there are so many kids in this fucking family that one of the ways that you can stand out and be noticed and get attention is to be exceptional. So you become very, very, very aware of the emotions of people around you, almost to the degree that you can predict what they want before they know that they want it, and then you meet that need for them, and then you get praised. You get told you're the goodest girl, you are the best child, look at what a great example she is, and this is why this is problematic because it's also predicated on this belief that love is conditional, that your parents will love you, will notice you, will see you, will value you if you provide them the right service. But if you don't do that, then that love gets taken away. And that's literally like the whole crux of this book, which is essentially that the moment that Jill stopped towing the party line and stopped accepting essentially, uh, you know, servitude, that Jim Bob revoked his love, revoked his approval and revoked his support for Jill and her husband. The thing about this type of abuse is that it essentially becomes a dynamic where parents figure out how to press the right series of silent buttons um, so that they can effectively puppet their kids, which is fucking terrifying. Like, I just wanna be super clear, again, abuse is not a competition, not one type is better or worse than the other, but this kind of abuse is like so insidious and sick because it's hard to see from the outside. From the outside, all you see is this beautiful family who all have these like perfectly manufactured smiles, right? And like, be suspicious of that shit. If you know anybody whose kids are never emotionally dysregulated, whose kids are uh, responsible and mature beyond their years, who can, uh, with an uncanny ability, predict, predict people's emotions and meet them, who seem to have this uh, weird ability to meet the needs of adults in the room, fucking red flag. Like, that's not a good thing. That's not a sign that this kid is just, oh, so mature. This is a sign that this child is being abused and like neglected to the degree that they, they probably have very little insight into their own emotions because they're so busy being um, aware and accountable for the emotions of others around them. Obviously, uh, in Jill's case, the way that we saw this play out was that Jim Bob effectively, silently, and without having to ask, managed to coerce Jill into re-traumatizing herself and betraying her own nervous system in order to protect him and his reputation and essentially their meal ticket um, without having to ask, which again, I just wanna be super clear, this is fucking terrifying. Like just because somebody didn't actually physically beat their child into submission doesn't mean that this child's will wasn't broken um, in a really severe and serious way. And so like, this is this is shitty. Please uh, don't, <laughs> please, please stop labeling this as like not as bad just because there isn't like physical violence present. Um, this is still very much abuse. The other place that we saw this show up was in regards to the way the family rallied around Josh. This is another moment that I will probably probably play you the audio clip for because I think, again, it's just really beautifully and succinctly put by Jill herself. Um, but essentially what we see is that Jill continually feels uh, hung out to dry. Um, she feels like she's been left to be vulnerable and sort of eaten alive by the tabloids, by the public at large. Um, and she's had her privacy continually violated. And yet when it comes down to protecting Josh, even though he is the perpetrator of harm in this home, the family seems to do a really good job of protecting his privacy, of preventing the media from finding out where he's going and doing this whole song and dance to show up for him and give him what he, what he needs. And so there's a moment in the book where Jill all of a sudden becomes aware of like 
this feels very unequal and this feels really bad. So I'll play you that clip right now. Here, Jim Bob is describing to the rest of the family during a family meeting the process of getting Josh to his latest rehabilitation center. He said that they had some trouble getting him up there because the paparazzi were trying to follow them, that they even tracked the tail number on his flight, uh, but at least we got him in there without being seen, he said. Uh, he reports on Josh's progress here and then says, the guy who runs the chapel said that they had some photographers show up at the open chapel looking for Josh, but the staff have been very kind to us and they were able to find a way to keep him out of sight. I just wanted to update everyone, et cetera, et cetera. Jill says that even after the discussion uh, shifted focus, that she couldn't get her dad's words out of her head because, uh, quote, I couldn't help but think about the lengths that Pops had gone to in order to guard Josh's privacy and to keep him from being publicly humiliated. When she later mentioned this to Derek, he confirmed he was feeling the same way, and she uh, notes that those feelings continued to grow stronger until she got to the point where she felt, quote, sick to my core. Jill describes how when the original In Touch story broke, all she wanted was to be protected. She had wanted privacy and a space to grieve without feeling the weight upon her to fix the situation. She says that she knows or knew at the time that her whole family, including her dad, was going to fight hard for justice in regards to those legal records being released when they weren't supposed to. But in thinking back on those situations, she describes what she wishes would have happened, uh, which is, quote, what I'd really wanted was for my pops to say, no, we're not going to put you on Fox News. I'm going to do everything I can to keep you girls out of this. We are not concerned about the future of our show anymore. She says essentially that she wanted her dad to stand up for her and that she had spent her whole life listening to the IBLP teachings about the umbrella of protection, but that when she had needed it the most, that it had failed her. She also says that I felt as though I, as a woman, was expected to do all I could to protect Pops and Josh, and nobody else appeared to see it any differently. Um, also worth noting here is that likely the girls were probably probably fed some iteration of the Gothard forgiveness above all else bullshit teaching, which essentially uh, victim blames uh, survivors of um, assault, even if it is childhood sexual abuse, and uh, speaks to like the virtue of forgiveness and all of this stuff. And so that in context with the way that uh, Jill has spoken about her family and the way that like all the roles kind of played out, it becomes clear that the the writing on the wall is essentially that feeling any amount of hurt feelings or frustration or inequity um, about Jill being left out to dry while everybody does the song and dance to protect Josh will be viewed by her family as disrespectful, as ungrateful, um, as being selfish. And this is just, again, this is important for us to note, not only because I think this is like a useful example to make, but also because again, this happens in abuse outside of these religious contexts. This is very much a thing that happens in these types of families where we internalize this belief system that self-advocacy is betrayal, which lends itself to negative outcomes in relationships in adulthood, which I wanna talk about. In adult relationships, this will often look like a person who, again, has this uncanny ability to read and interpret other people's emotions, but also that has this like self-sacrificing streak. These people are often willing to put their own needs last, um, oftentimes without people having to ask. They typically have really poor boundaries. They usually have a feeling of like constant guilt or shame. Um, and there's also a lot of hypervigilance that happens here. The thing that I wanna note about this first of all is that these factors uh, in adult relationships can make one more vulnerable to further victimization and abuse in adulthood. People who are abusers um, and who abuse people with like obvious uh, and malicious intent um, can clock this in survivors and exploit this for their own benefit. Um, but even in healthy relationships, these behaviors can be a problem because for example, if we've spent our entire life locked in this dynamic where it's my job to um, figure out what other people are feeling, meet that need before they even know it's a need for themselves, sacrifice my own self, never advocate for myself, constantly feel guilty and ashamed of myself, um, have no boundaries, be hyper vigilant about anytime someone's upset, but your partner doesn't, right? Your partner is comfortable communicating to you clearly when they're upset or when they need something, or your partner isn't going to just fly off the handle at you and get upset at you. Your partner's not gonna revoke their love from you. Then all of a sudden, it's like we're doing two different dances, right? The way that I explain family systems to my clients a lot is that we become attuned to the people around us. And so in family of origin, everybody plays a very specific role. And it's like, we're all doing this choreographed dance routine all of the time. And so if one person starts doing a different dance that they're supposed to be, then everybody around you is like, why are you doing that? Like, why would you fucking do that? And there's a very concerted energy or effort by the family to force you to do the dance that you were doing before. And so when we form partnerships in adulthood, 
you're doing your dance from family of origin and they're doing their dance from family of origin. Uh, but if you don't have the skills or the tools to uh, externalize and communicate why you're doing the dance that you're doing, then you just keep doing this dance. And your partner is like, why, why are you doing that? Like, this is very confusing. And so there's a lot of confusion. There can be a lot of hurt feelings. There's a lot of like discord um, in the partnership because you keep waiting for your partner to do the things that your parents did to you. You keep waiting for your partner to exploit you, to ask you to sacrifice yourself, to trample over top of your boundaries, to get mad at you for not intuiting their emotions. And this can be the source of a lot of problems. This is also uh, the issue with the abuse being implied rather than explicitly spoken is because when we internalize this belief system, we don't know why we're doing it. We just know that we need to do it, right? For what it's worth, this is a lot of the work that folks can do in therapy around this type of abuse, which is just learning how to externalize this, learning how to clock this in yourself, learning how to figure out why you feel this compulsion to do these things um, and how to challenge that, how to become aware and conscious of that so that we're not just mirroring this behavior, puppeting this behavior with seemingly like no, no like uh, prompting to do that. The other thing about this type of abuse that I wanted to draw your attention to is that it can create a whole host of issues when we talk about identity development. Um, it's very, very difficult for you to figure out who you actually are and what you actually care about when you've spent your entire life morphing your identity to mirror uh, the wants and needs of the people that you're around or the people that you're in relationship with. And Jill actually speaks to this in the book um, about how her um, involvement with therapy was pretty instrumental in her figuring out what she wanted and what she wanted her identity to embody. Jill speaks about how finding her own convictions caused her to feel a lot of guilt and shame, but was also um, confusing for her. Um, I think it's worth noting also that even her decision to go to therapy in the first place was literally spurred by the failed mediation that she had, the clip I played you earlier of Jim Bob verbally abusing her. Um, that was from a mediation that was conducted by, I'm assuming somebody who's not a clinician, I can only hope because that mediation was terrible, but her decision to go to therapy was brought on because after this failed mediation, the mediator uh, spoke to her and Derek privately and said, you need professional help, um, help that I cannot provide you. And I want to encourage you to go to your own therapy and your parents to go to their own therapy before you guys try to sit down and talk about this again. So even the thing that ended up being the vehicle for her to work on herself, to discover her identity, and to heal some of this child abuse was brought on because it was a vehicle for her to, recon or to, to reconcile with her parents. Like this, this is what I'm talking about. Like these are the depths to which children who've been abused like this disavow themselves and their needs. She was willing to go to this thing and for what it's worth, IBLP uh, really frowns upon and like, you know, discourages people away from, which is a fucking red flag. But she was willing to go do this thing because she saw it as a way to please her parents. Regardless of that though, I do just wanna give like a big high five uh, to her therapist for embodying what we talk about on the channel. Um, I sort of alluded to this at the beginning of the video, um, but we talk endlessly on this channel about how therapy is a thing that exists or can exist as a good fit for everyone, right? Um, I get a lot of flack on this channel um, for being a therapist that people were like, I would never want you as my therapist. Like you're not a Christian therapist. And like, that's fine, right? I occupy a very specific niche of the world of people who want therapy from someone who looks like me, who talks like me, who sounds like me. Um, but there is very much a therapist for everyone. And we also get a lot of flack on this channel um, for speaking about the problematic aspects of dogmatic religion, of fundamentalism and legalism. The insinuation being that therapists will never be satisfied unless you abandon in your faith altogether, right? And that's literally the opposite of what we saw. In the epilogue of this book, Jill talks about how she's so grateful for the work that her and Derek uh, both have done with their therapist, Ray. Um, she says, everybody needs a Mr. Macintosh <laughs> in their life. Um, and she talks about how they did a lot of wonderful work with this man, but that he also continually pointed them back to God, that he was a Christian therapist, that he was like a real therapist, as far as I'm aware, and in the sense that he's like educated and licensed and credentialed to be providing psychotherapy, um, but he was also a Christian. And so he was able to engage with her on this level of like, these are things that are problematic. And also here's how you can reconceptualize this to include your faith, to include your religion while also um, prioritizing yourself, while also creating safety for yourself, while also creating or, or hoping uh, anyways, to create relationships with your family that are healthy and that are um, like actually okay for you. This is the thing that I'm talking about. Would I ever vibe with a client who is like specifically looking 
going to, well, I don't know, I guess maybe. Um, but would I ever <laughs> buy with a client uh, like Jill Duggar? Probably not, but that doesn't mean that there's not a licensed, credentialed, uh, qualified clinician out there who very much can and who very much will. In the same way that uh, a very uh, Christian conservative therapist probably wouldn't vibe with some of the clients that I have, there is very much a client or, or a therapist for every type of client that exists out there. And I just really wanted to draw people's attention to this because therapy is a thing that can very much help everyone. Everybody serves or stands to gain something from being involved with uh, psychotherapy. Um, and it doesn't mean that you have to become this like caricature of what people think therapists are, right? Like obviously as a very progressive and leftist person, I would love to see lots of people become progressive and leftist and uh, tolerant and kind and compassionate to people of all walks of life. Um, but the reality is that not all people will get there, but that doesn't mean that those people aren't still worthy um, of love and belonging and creating healthy relationships and also unlearning shitty child abuse and fucked up toxic family dynamics and all, all of this kind of stuff. So yeah, Jill talks about how therapy helped her out a lot of her long dormant feelings um, and how she kind of discovered her identity outside of her family, um, but also outside of people pleasing. She learned to um, validate and love on these parts of herself that wanted to be seen, um, that wanted to be cared for by the people she was in relationship with. And let, like generally this was a, a healing thing for her. I also wanted to note here for what it's worth that Jill does still speak about most of her childhood in a relatively positive way, despite at the same time, also detailing uh, some pretty obvious abuse and neglect that existed. There's a moment where she talks about the food insecurity um, and eating bean sandwiches and things like that. Um, which first of all, I feel you girl. Um, but second of all, the parentification and the child labor and like the exploitation, she kind of writes all of this off as like things that she enjoyed at the time or things that were just sort of like quirky and like, you know, whatever. And the, the subtext, I guess, of that being that like, it's fine. Like she doesn't conceptualize or, or view this as a bad thing or a failure on her parents' part. I don't want to speak for her, obviously, but it does seem like she has some potential work to do around accurately labeling her experiences in childhood. The truth is that parents should never exploit their children or use them for labor. Parentifying your kids, asking your kids to be substitute parents for their younger siblings is fucked up, right? Um, food insecurity does not have to be a moral failing of your parents, but is also a thing that is traumatizing. We can hold those things in our hands at the same time. I did just want to talk about that because I think it's worth noting, but also because the hallmark, in my opinion, of a good clinician is being able to identify like where your client is at. Like there's a cliche in social work, at least that our work is to like meet clients where they are. Um, and this is very much that, right? Like sometimes therapists can clock from a hundred yards away that like we potentially have work or improvement or growth uh, to do on this thing, on that thing, on this thing, on that thing, on like on 12 different things, right? But your client might not be in a place where they're able to do that. And so the work in being an actually effective and good clinician is not in trying to force your client to address all of the things that are problematic all at once, but in meeting them where they are in providing them with a safe, safe space to unpack what they're ready to unpack and then potentially exploring more as time goes on, right? But also for what it's worth, sometimes clients just don't get there and that's also fine. I say this all the fucking time on this channel, but the work in therapy is not to become a perfectly self-actualized, finished human being. That's not real. That doesn't happen. There's no such thing as a perfectly uh, adapted or grown person person. Um, we're all flawed and fucked up. And then even when we do fix something, then we grow and something else gets fucked up. And so like, that's very normal. That's very human. Um, and a good therapist will be able to say, you know what? Yeah, maybe we could do some work around like, uh, you know, your parents using you to parent your siblings was actually pretty fucked up, but you know, maybe we're not there yet. And so like, I'm gonna leave it on the table, it's fine. We can maybe come back to it another day. My hope is that Jill is still in therapy and continuing to work on stuff. And so, you know, maybe she'll work on that eventually, um, but also maybe we won't, right? But that doesn't mean we can't make meaningful progress around like, no, your dad shouldn't verbally abuse you when he's upset at you, right? Or like, yes, it's not selfish for you uh, to want to be paid for your involvement in this uh, farce of a family show, right? And so I just wanted to draw people's attention to that because oftentimes the perspective is that therapists are these people who are like militant about like, these are all the things that are fucked up about you. And like, no. That's literally not true. Any good clinician, again, will be able to see that like maybe there's work that we can do on all of these things, 
But we, as a, a, a therapist, we want to do the work on things that you want, right? Like we should want to help you with the things that are important to you. We should be willing to guide you in the direction um, of the work that is most pertinent, most uh, available, most like approachable to you in this moment. And then maybe we can address the other stuff at a later date. For what it's worth, this is also why I will die on the hill that this like hyper individualistic and chronically online take of like, if your family's toxic, you have to no contact them immediately is like the worst fucking advice. Um, um, especially because if that were true, like if people really, if therapists especially gave people this advice that like your family was abusive, cut them off, Jill would have never stayed, right? Like people like Jill, people with severe trauma histories um, who feel a lot of uh, shame and guilt and anxiety about even having hurt feelings that their parents have abused them um, or even saying that their parents hurt their feelings um, are not going to be in a place to accept this kind of advice, right? So like this is my plea <laughs> begging you, please stop fucking giving people this advice. Going no contact with shitty family members is a perfectly valid choice. It's a great intervention for a lot of people. And for some people, especially people who are just starting out their work or who do have a particularly difficult time breaking away from this very enmeshed family of origin, that might not be a good option for them, right? Some people will never cut off their family of origin and that doesn't mean that they're not doing the work. It doesn't mean that they're not trying. It doesn't mean that they're just writing off their family's abuse, right? Abuse and like recovery from that is never cut and dry. It's not simple or, or black and white like that. So please stop fucking saying this shit to people. Um, everybody is entitled to find their own gray area, to find their own in-between that works for them and that creates a feeling of safety that like promotes their safety and security. The next thing that I want to talk about is attachment issues. This comes up a fair amount in the book, not by name explicitly, but like in theme, in my opinion. We talked on an episode of the podcast, actually, which if you didn't know, we have a podcast. Um, I'll link that in the description for you. Um, but we talked about how trauma, especially relationship trauma, often requires us to completely redraw our sense of what relationships look like or are supposed to look like um, and also our understanding of the world and like how we fit in that world and so that is what makes it so difficult when we talk about child abuse related to our family of origin because again not everybody is able or willing to do the thing where we like uh, redraw our whole sense of what relationships and family look like it requires us essentially to like start from zero and saying like everything that I knew about relationships before was a lie right I was indoctrinated uh, with a set of beliefs that turned out to not be fucking true. And so now I have to start over and figure out like, what is my moral compass? What do I believe about relationships? What do healthy relationships look like? This is a pretty heavy emotional burden to bear. This is also, again, why I say the thing that like, forcing people to cut off their family of origin is just not a realistic expectation because sometimes people will never be able to do that work because in order for abusive parents to uh, honor that they abuse you, it requires them to do that work first and they might not have the, the resources or the ability to do that. Doesn't mean you can't create safety in those relationships. But anyways, Jill talks a little bit about sort of starting over, right? Like reconceptualizing what her relationships look like, um, essentially because her entire life was predicated on this belief that relationships are only good if there's no conflict in them and that uh, the way that we achieve achieve love um, is by appeasing, especially authority figures, but like appeasing people generally, right? Even when it feels bad, even it re when it requires you uh, to abandon yourself and to sell yourself short. So I did just want to address this because even for all of his uh, faults and like fucked up beliefs, <laughs> um, Derek does seem to have helped Jill understand that love is not intended to be conditional. Love is not intended to be dependent on uh, a lack of conflict or, or tension in relationships. It seems like they together kind of figured out like what does uh, a healthy attachment actually look like. And so for what it's worth, for anybody who's struggling with attachment issues, please know um, that reparenting work like on an individual level obviously is really great and can be helpful. But this is also something that we can do in concert uh, with the people we are in relationship with, right? Um, sometimes we are simultaneously reparenting ourselves and reparenting our partners or each other. Um, and that doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing provided that we have healthy boundaries around that and we're being being like conscious about why or and how we're doing that. The other thing that I wanted to talk about in regards to attachment is the way that Jim, Bob and Michelle are so aggressively hot and cold 
um, or like on and off with their kids. It's this very confusing dynamic that they have. Um, and I wanna talk about it because I think uh, it's an important discussion to have in regards to child abuse. Again, especially because we have this caricature of child abuse only being about like physical and like very aggressive verbal abuse. And like the reality is that there's lots of things that parents can do to like fuck up their kids. And like, this is very much one of them. The truth is that abusive parents are rarely if ever um, abusive 100% of the time. And so acting like uh, abuse is only valid when parents are that way is like, first of all, really shitty to survivors, but also not true. I think it's doing a disservice to victims of abuse. Cause again, we have this like self judgy affect about like, well, my parents did do some good things or I do have some good memories. And so who am I to label my parents as abusive? So again, I just want to encourage people to be mindful of the way that we speak about this kind of stuff. What was I saying? My fucking brain is just... Uh, okay, I forgot what I was saying, uh, but for what it's worth, this like hot and cold affect, uh, we're gonna talk about specific examples of that in a second, but this can very much be intentional uh, depending on whether or not the person is trying to maliciously uh, like has malicious intent um, in abusing you. But this like cycle of providing affection and then withdrawing it, especially after like a perceived bad behavior is very much a way that abusers keep victims stuck. There's a whole cycle of abuse. I'll put it on the screen right now. But this way of being, this is also a thing that abusive parents do to their kids, which creates a lot of instability and a lot of fear in relationships. There is a thing, um, I'll try to put a diagram on the screen for you guys called the arousal relaxation cycle, which is not what it sounds like. Um, essentially this speaks to the phenomenon of, of small children, like infants usually, experiencing, like, this is what the, the typical healthy experience looks like for infants who are dependent on a caregiver. The cycle being essentially that like, if a baby is experiencing a need, for example, a dirty diaper, they experience this stimulus, they don't like it, and so they communicate in the way that they know how, which is to cry. Um, and then the caregiver's job is to meet that need by figuring out what the baby wants, meeting that need, soothing the baby, creating some physical contact, um, all of these kinds of things. This can be as simple as like giving eye contact to your baby. Um, that's part of like the arousal <laughs> relaxation cycle. Um, but successfully completing this cycle in infancy teaches small children that their caregivers are fundamentally reliable and safe people. This helps to inform our sense of trust and safety in relationships, but also the world. And so when caregivers are inconsistent in meeting this, it sends the message to your children that relationships are fundamentally unsafe, um, that they're unpredictable, and that your ability to receive love is sort of a crapshoot, right? That's why I wanted to talk about Michelle and Jim Bob's hot and cold behavior, because on one hand, Jim Bob will like send this email to Jill seemingly apologizing for all of his wrongdoings and listing these specific things that he says, I'm sorry for this, I'm sorry for that, but then following that up with an email, essentially saying like, fuck you for how much money you cost me to raise you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm trying to shame you and blame you and make you feel like shit. Granted, this was happening when Jill was an adult. And so the arousal relaxation cycle is slightly less, slightly less relevant here. Um, however, the point is still the same, which is that when caregivers provide this very inconsistent view of love, of affection, um, it fucks up the way that we <laughs> view relationships. We talked earlier about how like the effects of this type of abuse ripple into adulthood. And this is another one of those things. This is where the hypervigilance comes from typically when parents are very hot and cold like this. Kids will learn to read the mood and emotions of their caregivers to figure out like, where are we? Am I gonna get hate crimes right now? Or like, is this gonna be an okay situation? Um, and so in adulthood, we have this hypervigilance where we're trying to constantly read our partner's emotions. Um, these are also the kids who will have a really strong reaction to a partner experiencing frustration or upset about like being stuck in traffic or like someone accidentally breaking a dish, right? The response is typically like, oh fuck, they're gonna be mad at me. And this is because parents usually have this conditional sense of love, but also because again, this like hot and cold thing where like we can't accurately predict what version of mom or dad we're getting today. And so like, again, it just, it fucks up the way that we view relationships and our ability to like, uh, feel safe and secure in partnerships. We're sort of constantly waiting for the other shoe to drop, I guess is what I'm saying. Oh, also of note here is that this can fuck up your sense of uh, self-esteem and your like sense of self. Uh, this very much uh, teaches children that relationships and like love generally are unstable and insecure, but not because like they're necessarily just this way, but like because of you. It makes a lot of people feel this deep sense of shame about not being worthy of love, um, not feeling good enough for affection or et cetera, and especially feeling the need to earn affection which is again, a thing that Jill talks about in the book. That said, um, I wanna talk about some summarizing thoughts here. Uh, generally speaking, I think this book is a triumph, not just because it's really well written, um, but also because again, it's I think uh, a really
really well told story about deconstruction um, and it's living proof that therapy works. Therapy is really wonderful. Um, and also that healing from this type of abuse is possible, right? Um, even for somebody who seems like the most unlikely of candidates, Jill seems to have made a whole hell of a lot of progress in terms of, uh, you know, like the, the child abuse and, and family of origin trauma. And so like, I love that for her, but I also love what this represents for people. When Jeanette McCurdy wrote her book, I'm Glad My Mom Died, we talked about it on the channel, put that up here. But we talked about how sometimes having supportive and validating media like this is key in people's journey to doing their own work around these type of topics. And I think this book is very much that. Again, despite the fact that Jill and her husband do still very much uh, embody and uphold beliefs that like personally I find repugnant, it is an important victory for us to acknowledge um, that not only can people from these cultures deconstruct and uh, become better versions of themselves, but also that this type of healing is available for all of us, right? For what it's worth, I think this is also really interesting learning. There is kind of a uh, theory, I don't have any uh, research or evidence to back this up by the way, but just for what it's worth, there is a theory um, about deconstruction from these really uh, legalistic and dogmatic groups being essentially that the, the people who are the most convicted and committed to these belief systems, the people who really believe them to be true are oftentimes the ones that actually end up deconstructing and breaking away because when it becomes clear, like for example, in Jill's case, that it wasn't actually about, you know, protecting your kids that it wasn't actually about parents maintaining control because it's their duty to protect their children, but rather about Jim Bob lording this control and then doling out his affection uh, in a way that seemed pleasing to him. Um, it crumbles, this whole house of cards, right? And I think that's very much what we see happening for here here for Jill. Um, she was really committed to this belief system and really viewed it as like the way and the truth. And then when her family began <laughs> to behave in ways that were inconsistent with that belief system, it caused the cracks to form. And so again, I think this is just a really wonderful story about uh, deconstruction. And again, how deconstruction doesn't have to include an immediate pipeline into like uh, Satanism and <laughs> debauchery, right? Um, a lot of times that's also religious people's perspective is that anybody who, uh, you know, dares to question their faith or asks, uh, you know, why do we have to do it this way? Or is it possible for us to do it a different way? We'll immediately become a heathen, right? And that's not necessarily true. Don't get me wrong. I think that's also a wonderful <laughs> and valid journey, but I think it's important for us to honor that deconstruction doesn't have to be this like vigilante vendetta that all of us have against religious people. Deconstruction can very much just include uh, being a Christian person, being a person of faith, but just uh, sans the uh, shitty, toxic, uh, controlling, and abusive belief systems. Again, I think uh, generally speaking, there's still some problematic stuff with <laughs> Jill and Derek, but as far as like progress goes, I'm really happy to see someone, especially from someone, someone from this community making some meaningful progress and being open and unapologetic about that, being um, brave enough to speak about this openly because I think this is, um, again, just like a victory for us all. So I hope that you guys enjoy this. If you have read the book, please let me know what your thoughts and feelings are. Again, I know that I probably missed some stuff, but there's a lot of content in this book. So I tried to focus on the things that felt most uh, pertinent for today. And uh, yeah, if you like this video, like the video, you can subscribe to the channel if you want to support me. It does really help support us and the work that we're trying to do here. Um, and then share the video to help the channel grow and to help each other grow. And I will see you guys uh, next Saturday. Okay, bye. Hey.